Welcome back, pet parents. I'm so excited for today's episode. And one of the reasons is because, you know, just being a presence on social media, a lot of people tend to think that that people like me who are advocates for more holistic options of raising our pets do not want any you know, pharmaceuticals. We don't want traditional medicine at all. We think it's horrible. And that's actually not the case at all. I personally think there is a time and a place for both Eastern and Western medicine. There's a time and a place for pharmaceuticals as well as herbs and essential oils and all the wonderful things that come with, you know, more holistic modalities. And, you know, a couple of instances, you guys may remember just a few weeks ago, I was telling you about my cat, Romeo, who has resorptive disease and had to have 17 teeth pulled. Well, that's definitely a case in which we are thrilled to have traditional veterinary medicine, right? We want the anesthesia, we want the antibiotics, we want the anti-inflammatories, but we also want to do whatever we can holistically to help support the body through all of that. So because I am such a fan of integrative medicine, I am really, really thrilled to introduce you to today's guest, Dr. Gary Richter. So Dr. Richter is a holistic um, veterinarian, an integrative holistic veterinar veterinarian. He is the founder of Ultimate Pet Nutrition, which is a line of supplements and treats and freeze-dried foods for your pets. He's also an author. He's already authored an international bestseller called The Ultimate Pet Health Guide. And if you can believe it, he's releasing not one, but two new books on August 29th of 2023, Longevity for jo Dogs and Longevity for Cats. So Dr. Richter, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, would you mind just introducing yourself a little bit in case there was something I missed? Sure, of course. And thank you so much for having me. It's a, really a great pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you. Um, so introduce myself. So uh, obviously I'm a veterinarian. I've been practicing in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, for about 25 years. And during most of that time, uh, I've been I've been practicing integrative medicine. You know, I started out as a very Western trained veterinarian, um, you know, worked emergency, worked general practice. Um, and what I found over those years was I just really started to kind of see what the limitations were from the standpoint of Western medicine. And as, I, as you very appropriately described, there are a lot of really good and really important applications for Western medicine. Um, but the thing is, is it, is it can't do everything. Nothing can. Um, and I, I've never been a person that was just sort of satisfied with the, oh, well, we ran out of stuff to do. So that's that. Um, and as such, I've always been sort of looking for what other options are out there. And for me, that kind of started with acupuncture and then moved to chiropractic and herbal therapy. And over the years, it has expanded to any number of other modalities, um, physical therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, ozone therapy, what have you. Um, and what I've found over the years is by taking, by taking those alternative modalities and weaving them together with what Western medicine has to offer, that we often wind up with dramatically improved quality and quantity of life in patients. Uh, it is not uncommon in my office for somebody to come in where, you know, a veterinary specialist is given a dog or a cat, you know, weeks or months to live and, you know, a year or two years or three years later, they're still around. Um, you know, so I think it's really just a functioning of figuring out what the body needs and how to how to get it there. Uh, so that's really kind of where I come from, you know, from a professional motivation standpoint. In the past few years, I've become really fascinated with um, with this this sort of emerging scientific field of longevity science, uh, which honestly is largely focused on human healthcare, uh, but but it's all very much applicable uh, in veterinary medicine. And really, what longevity science is about is about it's about really picking apart the mechanics of why a body ages. You know, I mean, we often think of aging as sort of this an inevitable thing that happens to everybody. Um, and certainly since the dawn of time, that is a true statement. 
Uh, but the reality is, is there are very specific biological processes that, that make that happen. Uh, and, and it's fascinating that from a medical perspective, like we'll treat a person or an animal with heart disease or cancer or kidney disease, and nobody seems to think twice about trying to fix or reverse those conditions. But for some reason, trying to fix or reverse the mechanical processes that lead to aging seems like it's just out of people's ability to imagine. Uh, well, longevity science is changing all of that. Uh, you know, these these mechanics are being broken down into very discrete, um, you know, things that happen in the body. And there are now interventions uh, that can be used to interrupt many of these processes. And, you know, and what we're seeing, at least in, in laboratory animals and laboratory data, is that it is possible to dramatically slow the aging process sometimes stop it and sometimes even reverse it. Uh, and this is where the science is going on the human side. Nobody's really looking at it on the veterinary side. Um, and it was just something that I couldn't not look at. Um, and that ultimately led to these books that you mentioned, Longevity for Dogs and Longevity for Cats, which is a real, a real hard look at what we have available to us to improve the quality and quantity of lives uh, of, of our pets. It's so interesting, I think, because, you know, and I talk about this a lot where generally somebody in my position, not a veterinarian like, like yourself, we either get into, like really get into figuring out the best way to feed our dogs or the best way to feed ourselves, how we can improve our health span our dog's health span, our cat's health span, which you talk about too, the health span versus a lifespan. Mm -hmm. Either something happens to us and we just get sick and tired of it. And we're like, we've, I've got to find a better way. And then we realize, oh, I should be doing this for my pets too. Or something horrible happens to one of our pets. We figure it out for them and then say, mm -hmm. oh, I should be doing this for myself. <laughs> I feel so like true. it's one of those two things. And for me, it was my pets led to me getting, trying to get healthier. And I was recently reading, um, I say reading, I do all my books audio. <laughs> I, I, just, I just have to, it makes sure. me, it helps me get through them so much quicker. And I was reading The Glucose Revolution. I don't know if you've heard of, of that particular book and I wish I could say her name, she's French and I, I will butcher it. But she was talking about how because of the, um, insulin processes in the body and these blood glucose spikes that we have and that, of course, in today's society, we have far too many, far too high, that we're, we literally, the aging process is like the body cooking itself yeah. over time. The cartilage yeah. when you're a baby is nice and bright and white. And if you, when you autopsy somebody who's 80, 90 years old, their cartilage is like this brown, like it's been cooked. And it's, it, it was a really interesting way to think of aging. It really, it's stuck in my brain. And to think that there are tips and tricks and different things we can do that, you know, maybe our ancestors did 100, 200, 1,000, 2,000 years ago that we just have lost sight of because of the world we live in today, which is very toxic and very convenience driven, right? Sure. That we can drastically change the traje trajectory, if I could say that word, of our lives and our pets' lives. Um, and of course, the, these, you know, blood glucose spikes are just one, one little piece of the puzzle. I find every book I read is, is giving me more pieces of the puzzle. And so I'm really excited for your books on, for dogs and cats to, to help fill in some more puzzle pieces. But, um, yeah, I think just, hearing different things like that kind of trigger in your brain. For me, you're hearing that aging is like cooking that's stuck in my brain. <laughs> sure. Um, so when we think about, and, and I just, I just mentioned it, health span versus lifespan. Can you explain that to our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think lifespan is, is, is sort of self-evident. I mean, that is how long you or your pet is going to live. Uh, the problem with lifespan, um, I think, as we have all seen, both from, you know, whether it's our pets or it's a family member, 
Um, oftentimes the latter portions of life um, are not particularly wonderful for the individual. Um, you know, I mean, a prolonged geriatric period is not necessarily a blessing. Uh, you know, if, if that person or that animal is, is in pain, if they're suffering, uh, if they're cognitively impaired, uh, and that's really where health span comes in. Health span, you know, you can think of health span, uh, of, you know, think about it as the period of your life or your pet's life where everything works right, where, you know, where, you know, we're up, we're moving, we're active, we're, we're, we're mentally sharp, we're not in pain. And at some point in life, at least up until now, that starts to change and, and physical and mental processes decline and then health span starts to deteriorate. So, uh, you know, I mean, health span and lifespan are not absolutely not the same thing. And I think, and I think most people would agree that nobody wants to live to be 120 years old if you're decrepit in a wheelchair and can't do anything. But I mean, if I could feel as as good as I do right now until I'm 120 years old, well, I'm all about it. That sounds great. So the question is, is how does that work? How can we make that happen? How do I make that happen for my dogs? Um, and, and, you know, let's, let's go from there. Yeah. And obviously we want everybody to read the books when they come out in August, but can Please. you give us some pointers, some, uh, like just teasers of yeah. what these things can be for our pets? Absolutely. So, I mean, the books really kind of go through a full spectrum of, of interventions that people can take to help their pets live longer, better lives that really range everywhere from what are you feeding all the way up to super advanced high tech options, stem cell therapy, regenerative medicine, plasma exchange, what have you, uh, and everything in between. Um, you know, you said something a little bit earlier that really struck true to me is that, you know, you know, many, many years ago, I mean, you know, people and animals were in some ways they were eating better and living better than than we do now. Um, and that's undeniable. I mean, you know, hundreds of years ago, like everybody was by definition eating organic. Nobody was eating highly processed foods. Uh, you know, there was far less pollution and toxicity in the environment. And all of that is great. Um, the reason why people and animals did not live very long at the time is that they didn't have the benefits of modern medicine like we do. Uh, so if somebody got an infection, they're going to die. I mean, you think about like, is there anybody on this podcast that has not at some point in their life been on antibiotics for something? We pretty much all owe our lives to antibiotics and, and vaccines. And I know vaccines are a little controversial these days, but I mean, it's not that long ago that entire hospitals were filled with people in iron lungs that had polio. You know, it's like we can't lose sight of the of what the good that vaccines do. So so there's the question of like, how do we take advantage of like all of the good that fresh whole food diets and good living and exercise do for us and also take advantage of what modern science has because because that's where the magic happens so you know to to kind of get around to your question you know from a sneak preview perspective the very first thing that's discussed in both books is nutrition uh nutrition is legitimately the foundation upon which good health is built uh, you can do all of the high tech sciencey stuff you want, but if you're eating crap or your pets are eating crap, you are pushing rocks uphill. Uh, so, you know, there's a very detailed discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, about, um, about fresh whole food diets, be they raw, be they cooked, be they freeze dried, um, getting away from highly processed foods that are incredibly detrimental to our pet's health. Uh, you know, there is no getting around the fact that kibble and canned food is highly processed food and it comes with all of the health detriments that eating highly processed food does for people. Uh, it is a shame that most people are hearing from their veterinarian that they should feed their dog or their cat kibble. Um, and, you know, that's a 
that's an hour long podcast podcast unto itself as to why that is. But you know what? Diet and exercise and lifestyle is really the cornerstone of where all of this starts. Um, we have to give the body the fuel it needs, the activity that it needs to be healthy. And when we look at that, you know, the way I look at nutrition is you start by looking at what did that animal evolve eating? So, you know, humans evolved on an optimized diet that's different than a dog, that's different than a cat. What we all have in common is we all evolved eating fresh whole food diets, although the, the, the spectrum of nutrients would be different. But the bottom line is, is that, is that our bodies are not biologically significantly different than they were 20,000 years ago. Uh, so it's just like a car. My car is designed to run on a certain type of gas and a certain type of oil and various other fluids. And if you put different fluids in there, it's not going to run very well. But that for some reason is what we expect our bodies to do and what we expect our pets' bodies to do is we put inappropriate fuel in there and just say, we'll figure it out. Um, and it works for a little while. I mean, biology is remarkably forgiving. Uh, you can get away with it, but ultimately to use your, to use your analogy, that cartilage is going to cook. Uh, you know, things in the body are going to wear out and break down because they're not being properly maintained. Uh, and that's really where it all starts. And then, you know, once you get that sorted out, then we can really talk about sort of fine tuning nutrient wise with supplements. Then we can really start to talk about appropriate medical care and what's necessary and what's not. Um, you know, I just mentioned vaccines. I am very much a big proponent of vaccination. I am also very much a big opponent of over vaccination. So, the, you know, these are things that have to be looked at very carefully and they have to be looked at specifically to the individual. You know, one person's dog's lifestyle may necessitate a certain degree of vaccination while another one's doesn't. So you do what is necessary to do, but you don't do anymore. Uh, you know, the, I think one of the big problems with medicine, whether it's veterinary or human, uh, it's not very personalized. Uh, you know, we just have these protocols of this is what we do. Well, you know what? I mean, my lifestyle and my bi biological needs are probably different than yours, uh, which means that probably we should not be receiving exactly the same medical care. Um, but sadly, that's kind of how the medical system is set up um, because that's how doctors are trained. So we really need to start looking at this from a from an individualized, personalized medicine perspective. Uh, and and, you know, as we sort of move up the ladder, then we can really start getting into the, the what for me is like the fun technical stuff. Uh, the pharmaceuticals that we now know when used properly can promote longevity. Some of these technological advances, be they stem cell therapy, be it ozone therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, uh, all this stuff that really can start to pull these levers uh, and really change the way our bodies are functioning, our pets' bodies are functioning. And, you know, the next thing you know, you're, you're dramatically extending health span and presumably lifespan as well. It's really fascinating stuff. And I appreciate that you are, I think that's one of the, the benefits of the internet. Of course, there's a lot of pros and there's a lot of cons, right, to, to having so much access uh, at our fingertips uh, sure. 24 seven. But there are veterinarians <laughs> such as yourself. And of course, uh, you know, I've had a few others on the podcast who are very open minded, who are, are very much Yes, we absolutely need to utilize the advances in modern medicine, but we also don't want to forget the things that have worked for centuries that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we seem to ignore or call witchcraft now, <laughs> which is so silly, but it is the way it is. So yeah. if we could switch gears just a little bit, a little birdie told me that there is also some information in these new books about our pet's mental health. And I know it's very popular with, I think, you know, and I don't know what our age differences are, but people, people in my generation, I think, did not necessarily get the benefit of this. But after me, a lot of the newer generations are like, I mean, they're just so fine-tuned into 
their mental health and how important it is. And sure. while some of us, <clears throat> our generation may sometimes say, you need to chill out a little bit, there is some validity into what they're doing and what they are, um, you know, th these journeys they're going on to improve mental health. And it can be very beneficial for our pets too. Can you extrapolate on that just a little bit? Sure. Yeah. It's funny that you bring that up. I, literally like a half hour ago, I was having a conversation with a veterinarian in my office about this, this, this newfangled concept in younger veterinarians of work-life balance. Unbelievable. What a concept. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you know, when I got out of vet school, work-life balance meant you worked, you know, that, that was that. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, that that's what was expected of you. You know, you worked until the work was done. Um, you know, people of younger generations now have discovered the benefits of not driving themselves into the ground emotionally, psychologically. Um, and it's an amazing thing. I see that in my 18 year old daughter. She actually has an innate concept of her own mental health. Unbelievable. Like that would never have been a thing when I was 18. When I was 18, mm -hmm. if you had a problem, you sucked it up and dealt with it on your own. I know. Yeah, Rub some dirt on it and walk it off. Like, that's right, what I got. Yeah, you know, <laughs> God forbid you talk to somebody about your problems, right? Um, but, you know, I mean, this is all true from, from, an, from an animal perspective as well. You know, again, you know, we look at sort of evolutionarily speaking, you know, what is a lifestyle that is natural for a dog or a cat? Um, it should come as no surprise to anybody that a natural sort of environment for a cat is different than a dog. Dogs are incredibly social creatures. They live in packs. Cats, for the most part, with the lions being the notable exception, cats generally live solitary lives in the wild. Um, you know, so it's not to say that one can't have multiple cats in a household and have that be fine, but people should realize that that's not always a natural environment for them. And sometimes that can be a source of stress. Um, uh, certainly the, the lifestyle of the owner can be a source of stress and anxiety for animals, particularly if the owner themselves is a high stress individual, particularly if in the house there's maybe a, shall we say, a tumultuous relationship and there's a lot of yelling and arguing. If you think that's not having an impact on your pet, you are kidding yourself. Uh, you know, our pets are incredibly in tune to what is going on around them and the people around them far, far more than we are. We as people, I mean, honestly, we're oblivious uh, to what goes on around us compared to animals that are so much more in tune. And, and you know, there's a there's a very long discussion in both books about, about the, both the benefits of appropriate lifestyle and the potential negative impacts of, of inappropriate lifestyle. And some of that's about getting appropriate exercise some of that's about, uh, you know, socialization and social interaction time and really understanding, you know, both the species that you're dealing with, um, the breed, particularly when it comes to dogs, um, because, you know, I mean, I have Shih Tzus at home. So they're little flurfy dogs that want nothing more than to sit around and hang out on the couch and be with you. Um, you know, you take a Border Collie. And if a Border Collie lived the life that my Shih Tzus are living, they would absolutely go bonkers. You know, a dog like that needs to get out and run and do stuff and they need a job and they need to think about stuff. I love my dogs to death, but they are not winning any spelling bees. Um, you know, but, but a Border Collie or some other kind of herding breed, you better give them some sort of mental stimulation or they're gonna go nuts. Um, and that's what this is really about. Again, it's individualized healthcare. Um, you have to, you have to tailor an environment that works for the individual animal. And, and, you know, that starts with having these considerations before you even own the animal. <clears throat> because, you know, if you work 14 hours a day and you live in a one bedroom apartment, don't get a high energy dog. Uh, it's not gonna be good for anybody. Uh, you know, and like people need to think about this. If you're gonna get a pet, you wanna get a pet that is that is compatible with your lifestyle. Um, because ultimately, not only is that gonna negatively impact you if you do this wrong, but it's probably gonna dramatically negatively impact the animal and potentially even shorten their lifespan if they're living in chronic stress. Uh, it's no mystery that chronic stress will shorten your life. 
we see that all the time with people. And, and again, like if you think that's not happening in animals, think again. For sure. And a connection with nature. I find that to be especially difficult to get across to cat owners. And it can be very difficult to do when, when we have cats, because a lot of times we have cats because of the living environments that we are in, you know, we're, yeah. we're on a high rise or, you know, some sort of apartment. And, sure. but even if we can bring some of the outdoors in, no, I you agree. know, how I mean, beneficial when it comes to that cats, Yeah. I am a, I am a very, very strong proponent of strictly indoor cats. Um, it is better for the cat. It is better for the environment. Um, uh, but there are ways to provide environmental enrichment inside your house to keep your cat happy. Um, you know, there are things that you can do to, to give them things to do and to, you know, allow them to sort of exercise their normal sort of hunting abilities within, with, within the house. There's also, if you, depending on sort of where you live, they make these really fantastic, um, uh, products that are like, you can sort of make an enclosed outdoor environment for your cat, like in your yard, they just can't really go anywhere. Um, it reminds me of like a habit trail that you had for as a kid with your, with your hamster, but it's a giant thing for a cat, but that way they get to be outside and look at the birds and smell things, but they're also not in danger. Um, they're not going to get attacked by another animal run over by a car. They're also not murdering the songbird population, uh, which cats unfortunately have a tendency to do also. So, you know, there's ways to do this. It just requires a little bit of thought and, you know, and planning. Sure. So I know supplements are a hot topic. They are for me, for sure, because first and foremost, if I can if I can achieve what I need to achieve in my pet with whole foods, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. Sure. But that may not always be the case, especially for some animals that do have issues, whatever medical issues may be going on. What are your thoughts on supplements? Obviously, it sounds like nutrition first, right? Get the best quality nutrition first. You've already said that. But yeah. when we're looking at supplements for our animals, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Sure. It will come as no surprise to you that I have some thoughts on that. Um, um, so, so yes, absolutely. Animals, ideally speaking, should be eating a fresh whole food diet. Um, that said, that does not mean that they would not benefit from supplementation. Part of that is because the reality is um, that fresh whole foods today are not necessarily as nutritious as they used to be back in the day, which is, a again, a whole nother conversation about why that is. Um, but the other piece of it is, is again, we're talking about longevity here. So we're not talking about adequate nutrition. We're talking about optimized nutrition. There's a difference. Uh, you know, it may be that that balanced diet that you're feeding has enough vitamins and minerals in there to make sure like your, your dog or your cat doesn't get a deficiency, but is there enough in there to truly optimize their systems and slow their aging process? Maybe, maybe not kind of depends on what they're eating. Uh, so I am a very, very big fan of supplementation. Uh, uh, you know, there are certain supplements that I think almost across the board can be beneficial. Probably the two lowest hanging fruits in that sense would be omega fatty acids and probiotics. Uh, there are, there, you, you'd be hard pressed to find a person or an animal that would not benefit from a probiotic or an omega fatty acid supplement. Uh, everything beyond that, I think, becomes sort of an individualized thing. And, and these days there are there are some testing parameters that you can run um, to start to quantify what may be needed. So, you know, we routinely in my office test for omega fatty acid levels. We test for vitamin D levels, vitamin B levels, various minerals. Um, you'd be surprised how many animals that are eating a fresh whole food diet are still deficient in vitamin D. Uh, I would say it's 75% or more, um, you know, and, and we know that vitamin D has an enormous impact on aging, um, on cancer prevention, uh, on overall longevity. And it's the easiest thing in the world to fix if, it, you know, if that's the problem, but you just have to know. Uh, it's not necessarily a good idea to just blindly supplement things if, if there's a way to quantify it. 
Um, you know, and the other thing that I would say as it pertains to supplementation is people can also get, get too far down the rabbit hole and do too much. Um, they're over supplementing things from the perspective of either it becomes problematic because all of a sudden the pet doesn't want to eat their food because it tastes like vitamins. Um, it could be that they're getting so much that they're not actually absorbing everything that they're eating anyway. Um, and the reality is, is that, is that you can rotate through different supplements, you know, every couple of months, maybe shift to a, a different spectrum of things. And, you know, I, the, you know, getting back to sort of evolution, nobody's body was designed to eat the exact same spectrum of nutrients every day. That's just not how it worked back in the day. Um, so, so getting something here, something there, mixing things up a bit, that's how our bodies are designed. We're just fine. Uh, you know, so that's, that's really where I sit with this. I mean, as it pertains to the books, uh, there's a, a, a very long list of, of supplements, well over 30 uh, in each book, uh, where I go through and discuss the benefits of each one. Uh, for most of them, make some dosing suggestions, talk about exactly how that supplement has the potential to impact longevity. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of very actionable information in there on what people can do. And more importantly, sort of how they can do it and do it successfully. In the books, I know there are like the top three things that humans die of are basically the top three things that our dogs are dying of as well. So, and, I, and I think, I think off the top of my head, it's like cancer, heart disease, and some sort of medical malpractice. Something goes wrong <clears throat> in medicine the sure. top three things they just fall differently as like far as the percentages in humans and dogs and i find that that kind of correlation fascinating and i'm getting an amazon delivery so my dog is barking i am so sorry <laughs> that's <Thank> my world <laughs> oh my goodness it happens like every time i record it's okay um, so I find that correlation fascinating because so many people see our dogs as other, you know, mm -hmm. they are just, th there are animals that live in our house that we have to take care of. And of course we love them on some level, some of us more than others, some of us like myself right. who, you know, and obviously we don't know each other that well. I wasn't able to have children. So my pets are my children. And sure. so I love them very, very much. And I understand not everybody has that same level, but that, that correlation that, that, that we are living in the same environment, probably eating very similarly. If our pets are eating these, you know, super high processed foods, there's a good chance that Mm -hmm. The humans in the house are also eating a lot of really high processed foods um, and that we're dying of the same things. So are, do, do we talk about some of these things in the book that are these top contributors to, you know, what our pets are dying of and and things we should be on the lookout to, to yeah, just improve I, I, you know, their lives? I mean, a lot of it, it's a great question. A lot of it's really sort of, it's about how to sort of avoid this stuff and prevent it. And, you know, sure, like, you know, if, if, if push comes to shove and a pet gets cancer or heart disease or whatnot, you know, uh, you know, it, the books don't go into sort of specific, like, here's how to treat cancer, because, you know, you'd wind up with a book the size of the New York City phone book. Um, and ironically, uh, a lot of that is actually covered in my first book, The Ultimate Pet Health Guide. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's there for you. Um, you just can't put everything in, in everything. But um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, so much of this is about prevention. So, you know, the thing is, is like when a dog or a cat or even a person for that matter gets cancer, it's not a function of the fact that they were perfectly healthy one day and the next day they had cancer. Cancer is the manifestation of years of problems happening in the body, whether that is whether that is chronic inflammation whether that is exposure to chemical compounds that are causing abnormal cellular division. Uh, there's any number of potential underlying causes that cause cancer, but cancer is functionally a symptom of a much, much longer disease process. And truthfully, 
that's actually the case with a lot of chronic diseases, uh, you know, be it be it arthritis, be it back issues, you know, like, you know, when you hear somebody say, wow, I, I just bent down to tie my shoes and I blew a disc. That is not what happened. You know, what happened was, is that person's been slowly injuring that disc for years. And then when they bent down, that was finally that was the last of it. And the thing blew. But I mean, I can assure you that disc was not perfectly healthy that morning. Uh, you know, so so much of this is about setting the stage so that we don't wind up having to put these fires out later in life. And, and you know, I think one of the one of the problematic things from the standpoint of like the way our human brains work, if we're going to get back to the evolution discussion, is we are we are very well evolved to deal with an immediate threat. You know, a bear jumps out of the bushes. You run like hell. We're very, very good at that. What we're not good at is dealing with long-term vague threats. I mean, why do you think people keep smoking cigarettes? I mean, every single person that smokes cigarettes full well knows it's probably going to kill them. But it's such a vague, oh, that could happen someday in the future kind of thing. Um, you know, if if literally smoking a cigarette was, was Russian roulette, like you had a one in six chance of dying right at this moment, I think you'd have a lot less people smoking cigarettes. Um, because that's just how our brains work. And unfortunately, that's how it works with nutrition as well. Um, you know, a lot of people eat really bad food, but they're not really thinking about it in the terms of, oh, this is clogging my coronary arteries and I'm going to die. They're just thinking about it makes me feel good and it's tasty. I'll deal with the consequences later. We're very bad at long term planning when it comes to that kind of stuff. Our brains just aren't wired that way. And it takes it takes intentional thought to do it. Um, and, and just to be clear, I'm as guilty of that as anybody. Like my brain doesn't work that way either. You really have to sit down and think about it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I put these books together is because it provides a very, a very followable framework for people of, okay, this is what I need to do. So let me, let me make this easy for people so they don't have to sort of think these real big picture, like what's going to happen. Um, so, you know, now it's going to be like, okay, so, you know, here's your actionable items. Let's do this. Um, and, and like I said, the great thing about biology is it's incredibly forgiving. Uh, even if bad things have happened up until now, if you start doing the right things, you can make things a lot better. You can reverse that damage in many cases. So, uh, you know, it's never too late, uh, to kind of get on the right path. That is a perfect segue into what I was going to say next, which is that um, yesterday is the best day to start, but today is the second best day. Amen and to it that. sounds like even by doing just a little bit at a time, yep. we can make some pretty big changes yes. in the tra trajectory. I don't know why I keep wanting to say a word that I can't say, but trajectory. <laughs> of our lives and our pets' lives. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Richter. I know that uh, we can already get the ultimate uh, pet health guide on mm -hmm. Amazon, and I will put that link in the description August 29th, yes. correct? 2023, yes. yep. longevity for dogs and longevity for cats. Will that also be available on Amazon? It will. Perfect. And then ultimate pet nutrition. I know mm -hmm. we didn't talk about that, but that is your website, correct? And there's a lot of yes. stuff there. Yes. So yeah, I mean, ultimate pet nutrition is really, I mean, that's the, that's the manifestation of a lot of what we were just talking about. Um, fresh whole food diets, appropriate supplementation, uh, products that are made consciously and carefully uh, you know, to make sure that they are, that, that they're not only put together right, but they're manufactured right. Um, so that you don't have to worry about the quality of what you're giving. I mean, there's, it's such a rough landscape out there when it comes to things like food and supplements. Um, and it's very hard for people that don't have the medical and scientific training to know how to discern what's good and what's not. Um, so again, this is me trying to make this easy and sustainable for people. Um, so that you don't have to think too hard about this, um, but you can still do it a, a world of good for your pets. 
Well, I think I think we've said it all. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, make sure to check the show notes for the links to find uh, all of the books. Well, I will update the show notes <laughs> and post about it um, when the new books are available. But for now, you can get the Ultimate Pet Health Guide on Amazon. Certainly check out the food, treats, and supplements at Ultimate petnutrition.com and follow you're on socials correct yep i will make sure to put all of the links so you can follow dr richter on socials thank you again for doing what you do for our pets we need more people out there like you doing this and uh, i want you to know you are appreciated and thank you for being here oh thank you and thank you for having me Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.